Okay, so I'm going to tell you about the time that I found out how people actually have sex. I grew up in a Muslim household. I went to a Muslim school, so I wasn't really aware of a lot of things that, I mean, that everybody else knew. So I was 14 years old, mind you, and that's a very old age to find out how people have sex. So I was walking with my friend one day and she had older sisters. She always had the magazines like Cosmo and all these like movies that she would watch with her older sisters who were like 16 or 17 at the time. So she always knew a little bit more than what the rest of us knew. So she starts talking about sex and I'm just like, okay, it sounds kind of dirty. It sounds like something we don't do. It sounds fake. And she is just like, no, everybody has sex. That's how you have kids. And I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. And then, um, I just couldn't believe her. Like, I was like, okay, some people have sex, but sex to me was always kind of like a mistake. Like, you know, every time I, I heard about sex, it was like a teenager who got accidentally pregnant. Like, it's not something that you plan. It just kind of happens, and it's not like really what like smart people do. So she starts talking about it, and I'm just like, this girl doesn't know what she's saying. Like, she's dumb. I hate her. And she keeps going on and on. And I'm so offended at this point because I was like, there has to be another way. Like, I've never heard of people having sex. Like, I know I have siblings. I have cousins. I've Like, people in my life don't have sex. And then uh, she's just like, no, everyone in your life has sex. You're just stupid. And I'm 14, again, 14 years old. And she's like, listen, everybody has sex. Like, you just don't know. But then I stop and I'm just like, this doesn't make sense. So I'm, I force her to stop talking. She's, she's just going on with her story. I force her to stop talking and I'm just like, listen, are you trying to tell me that our parents have sex? And now she's completely confused and she's like, yes, our parents have sex. What you, like, what is your problem? And at this point, I am so offended. I'm so offended. I stop and I'm just like, are you trying to tell me that the Prophet Muhammad had sex? And at this point, her jaw drops because she's so confused. She's like, what is wrong with this girl? And she's like, yeah, he had sex. And I was so upset. I literally stopped talking to her. I told her, you're going to hell. And I walked away. And that is how I found out that everybody has sex. Yeah. So I went to Nepal. We took a flight there. We arrived in Kathmandu. We arrived around the, I want to say, late morning. We saw the sights, and it was nice, right? It was uh, as I expected, right? When we had arrived back at the uh, hotel, the Yak and Yeti, there was a square <coughs> sort of away from the hotel uh, that people would go to. So I decided to go along with a group of other kids and the, and the uh, Sherpas. The Sherpas are our guides. I, I looked towards a certain direction at a man it was sitting on obviously poor, obviously a beggar. Now, I had seen beggars before. Right? I, I would uh, go to Jordan over the summer and I would see, you know, people begging for, for, for uh, you know, money and stuff. But something made me want to ask the Sherpa, what is, what's happening over there? And so the Sherpa looks at me and he says, Omar, the, uh, the people are saying that this man is going to chop off his leg. I say, okay. Why is that? He says, Omar, because he's too poor. And I said, is he sick? Is he, I mean, he has to get amputated? He said, no. He said, when he begs, he does not make enough money. So if he, he believes that if he doesn't have one leg, it'll help people feel more pity for him and they will give him more money. And it was an eye opener. And the next day, we were actually planned to uh, take a small plane to uh, where we would start our hike. So I decided that before the morning start, before we leave, I was going to go back to the square just to see this man, to see if what I had assumed or what I was told was going to be true. Because to, to a certain degree, it was surreal. And so I, uh, I went early in the day. No one knew this, and I and I just went to the square, and I was looking for the for the man. And there he is, sitting, obviously wounded. There's 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 no leg. There's you know he has a a bandage and then a covering over his uh, his lower half, begging for money. And I had some extra money left, and 
I wanted, I, I, I gave him money, but I didn't want to give it to him because he chopped his leg off. I wanted to give it to him. Like I, I, there was this feeling of why didn't I couldn't, why couldn't I have given it to him yesterday and told him there's no need. Like, don't worry, you don't need to do this. And I guess it sort of, you know, woke me up to see what, what truly is poverty, right? What, what does it mean to be poor? Teta, like, I think what I remember most about her um, is her quirkiness. And this one wakes up at 6 a.m. every day and goes to bed at 8 p.m. And the whole time she's working, like the whole time, like she does not sit down. When she sits down, it's because we force her to sit down to have coffee three times a day. She's wild. Like she's, and she's 81. Did I not mention that? She's 81 years old. So anyway, um, <laughs> before I go to work, it'll be just me and her in the house. My mom's still sleeping. My other sister is at work already. And she's like very religious, like I mentioned. So she'll look up and she'll make sure I'm in a, in a, a part of the house where I can hear her. And she'll be like, Oh God, <laughs> she'll look up to the ceiling. Oh God, but it's in Arabic. You know, like who is going to get me uh, a gallon of water today? Oh, Ya Rab, who, God, I wish there was someone that could get me uh, a carton of eggs today. And then she'll like look to the side <laughs> and I'll be there. <laughs> And I'll like wait for her to directly ask me, you know, Tina, when you come back from work, you can pick up a carton of eggs or a gallon of water. And I'll wait for it and she'll never ask, ever. So she'll be like, Ya Rab, you mean, like who, who can do this for me? <laughs> so I'll put on my heels, get ready for work. I'll be like, Teta, like, I'll get you whatever you want today, you know? When I come home from work, I'll get you eggs. I'm not gonna be home till seven, so is that okay? She's like, oh, you're so amazing. Like, may God bless you. Like, you're incredible. <laughs> this has been happening for like 20 years. My grandfather has eight siblings and he lived in Haifa, which is a town in Palestine. And his father was a fleet man. He had a lot of fleets and they would go fishing. And when my grandpa was 11, uh, the Nakba happened, or 1948. And what happened was, he says that they forcefully came in and basically kicked them out. My great-grandfather, who had a fleet of ships, had to end up working on one of his own ships. Because all the money that he had, at least saved up in his house, he used to send his children and his wife uh, to Lebanon. And he had to stay for 10 extra years just to work and make enough money to then go join them afterwards. So they stayed in Lebanon for a while. My grandfather, 50 years later, finally gets to go back to Palestine for the first time, just to visit. And he goes to Haifa. And what he really wanted to do was he really wanted to see his family home again. Because it was a nice house. And it was filled with memories, fun and laughter, and he wanted to see it. So he goes, and he said that it was changed. It wasn't like the Palestine that he knew before. He went, and he couldn't find his house. Everything was so different. Everything was so strange. And he was 78, or I'm sorry, 71 at this point. 60 years later, he left when he was 11. So he goes, he goes, and he finds this really old photographer and then he's like um do you know if there are any houses here because i'm trying to look for my own house and then he's like and the photographer says you're standing where the houses used to be my grandpa looks around and he's in a mall so he's like what happened the old man says after 1948 a couple of years later, they decided to tear down all the houses that were here and then build a mall. And my grandpa's house was so large that they actually used the framework to be the grand entrance for the mall. And the old man said, well, I was here for a while and I decided to actually take a picture of it right before they tore it down. And he hands this photo to my grandpa and my grandpa said it was the first time he cried in a while. Isn't it strange how we come alive with our stories? How we light up at the opportunity to tell them. We go about our lives 
living each day as the main characters of our own existence, and by doing so, we blind ourselves to the fact that everyone around us is living through their own story. We were given this beautiful, three-dimensional world, and yet we walk through life as if everyone around us is paper, flat, blank, uninteresting, not worthy of our focus. Why do you think it was so easy for us to become attached to the flat screens of our lives, our televisions, our laptops, our phones, It's so easy, so simple to be the only interesting dynamic character in our own story. But what if we did focus? What if we were to detect the life that is being experienced right in our line of sight? How would we change? Would we appreciate the wonders of human existence, achievement, Endurance? Skill? Our interactions with the world around us would revolutionize humanity as we know it. We wouldn't be scared to make eye contact. We would crave it. It wouldn't be so easy for the media to dehumanize entire factions of the human race. We would be able to look around us and see friends, not strangers, allies not enemies. This is how we could change. This is how we could be.